And greetings. Happy Monday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show, live and on demand right here on Blaze TV radio and podcast. I am Steve Dace. He's Todd Erzin. He's Aaron McIntyre. And you are tuned in here for the next two hours, we hope, although we will likely say something that will drive you away. It's just our way. Coming up a little bit later on in the show, uh, the campaign on, in Iowa fully got underway over the weekend, and it is already dumb. <laughs> it's already dumb. Gosh. Evergreen. The amount of people who sent me weather reports and radar screenshots from 50, 100, 200 miles away, and they're still doing it. It is still going on. It's cloudy with a chance of meatballs. <laughs> Gosh. It's just... Oh, I'm sure it'll be an Aaron's montage. I know our good buddy Bob Vanderplot's kind of the godfather of the Iowa caucuses. He'll want to talk to us about it here at the bottom of the hour. Next hour, we're going to play our weekly game of Ask Me Anything. You've got some good questions left over from last week, right? I thought so, yes. And I thought it was it was only fair since I spent probably more time than I should have Saturday just completely dunking on... Uh, flunky meteorology and geography lessons in Iowa from people who don't live here that we go ahead and let uh, Trump's truth social ask the questions this week. So whatever you you got that uh, you need filled in from last week's leftovers, I hope you got some good ones from uh, the truth social crowd over there. Well, Aaron's my partner in crime on that. It, full disclosure, uh, I... I pull an Aaron McIntyre on this front. I, I do not have a Truth Social account still to this. Oh, so you need him to grab the so, questions uh, for when you? When we do Truth Social, Aaron dives in there for me because I've just, I just, I... I apparently don't have one either. The amount, <laughs> yeah. of, the amount of people who have told me they have looked for me on Truth Social and cannot find me. <laughs> there, I will just say today's selection, there is a mix, uh, a mix, a mix of questions. I did it again. I, I was trying to time it since Aaron uh, made sure to go to me uh, back on screen right as I was rubbing my nose the I'm first so time. I'm so sorry. I made sure. I, this time I did it on purpose. I was trying to time when I thought you might get done, and then I was going to rub my nose real quick just to see if you were going to do it again, and you did. So that's what happens. That That's your staff holding you up, lifting you up, making sure to put you in the best possible light. And I can't you know, thank you I, enough. I didn't, uh, I didn't realize I'd done that once nor twice, but now that I'm aware of that, I'll do it every time. Exactly. That's how we roll around here. We're not here to edify each other. We're here to tear each other down because we're men. That's what we like to do is tear each other down. So we'll get to all of that. But before we do, before it gets dumb, because it's going to get dumb, there's just no way to avoid it not getting dumb. All right. After what happened this weekend, it's going to get dumb. Are we back to the one who's dumbest last loses? We might be. We, we might be. Let's have a serious conversation at least once today. Remember our friends at Preborn, outstanding pro-life ministry. Our goal this year is to partner with them in saving 70,000 babies here in 2023. They have saved tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of babies over the years with their ministry. And what they do is they practice real truth and grace. They confront crisis mothers with the truth that they are carrying another live being with the ultrasound. They hear the heartbeat and that convicts their conscience about 80% of the time and they don't go through with killing their child, blessedly. But now the battle is, is, is not fully won. And that's where the grace part comes in. These are still moms. You know, if you're, if you're in a happy marriage... If you are, um, if you're, if you're fulfilled in life, if you feel loved and safe in your home as a woman, chances are you're not thinking of killing your child when you find out you're pregnant. Fair? Yeah. And by and large, the kinds of women that do think about that don't have those things in their lives. Correct. Or they're like my mom was at 15 years old. Okay. And, and thinking I'm not even ready for something like this. Right. And that's where the grace comes in. And they offer counseling, prenatal care, postnatal care. All of that stuff is free because of donations from people like us. All right. So if, if you want to see your love turned into action with a tax deductible gift, preborn.com slash Steve, that's where you want to go. Help them love them both, both mom and the baby at preborn.com slash Steve or hit pound 250 on your mobile device, pound 250 on your mobile phone, or preborn.com slash Steve. And with that, let's get dumb. Here's Aaron's montage of what happened while we were away.
What happened while we were away brought to you by Cloudy with a chance of pea-sized crowds. Donald Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis were slated to show up in the first in the nation caucus state of Iowa over the weekend, but only one did. Donald Trump, after reading the weather forecast, saw that it was cloudy with a chance of pea-sized crowds in Des Moines where he was supposed to have a rally. So he canceled. He and his flax blamed a long-expired tornado watch as the reason for the cancellation. Meanwhile, DeSantis barnstormed the state, starting in in Sioux Center, Northwest Iowa, for an event hosted by Iowa Congressman Randy Feenstra. It occurred to me that you can have the best declaration of independence in the world, you could have the best constitution in the world, but if you don't have people that are willing throughout, throughout our history to stand up, put on that uniform, risk their lives, and in many instances give that last full measure of devotion, then it isn't going to amount to very much. And so we are not called upon to make sacrifices of that magnitude, uh, but we're also called upon uh, to do battle in the political arena. So what I say to you as Republicans, put on the full armor of God. Take your stand. Stand firm for truth. We must fight the good fight. We must finish the race, and we must keep the faith. I can tell you this. I am proud of what we've done in Florida. I'm thankful what Governor Reynolds and the team have done in Iowa, but I've only begun to fight. DeSantis also made a stop in eastern Iowa, and after he'd learned Trump had punked out on visiting the state, he made his way back to Des Moines to stop at a BBQ joint just five minutes away from where Trump's rally was supposed to have been. Florida and Iowa are a source of hope. Uh, because we show you can get it done. Uh, requires leadership, requires commitment to principle, requires some courage, uh, but if you're willing to do that and you're willing to deliver results, uh, the people are there. They'll follow. This weekend got even worse for Trump. In an interview with The Messenger, he hit DeSantis from the left on the life issue, saying, quote, if you look at what DeSantis did, a lot of people don't even know if he knew what he was doing, but he signed six weeks, and many people within the pro-life movement feel that was too harsh, and quote. He's talking, of course, about Florida's six-week baby-killing ban. So Donald Trump's plan for Iowa is to punk out on visiting the state and move to the left on the life issue. Good luck. Meanwhile, Ron DeSantis late last week signed a bill that forever ends COVID mandates like masking in schools in his state, forces providers to obtain consent before giving medication for the treatment of COVID, protects the free speech of doctors, and bans gain-of-function research in the state. Moving on, Joe Biden spoke at Howard University's commencement over the weekend, and in the midst of one of the worst crises at the southern border in recent memory, had these comments. So stand up against the poison of white supremacy as I did my inaugural address to a single out as the most dangerous terrorist threat to our homeland is white supremacy. I'm not saying this because I'm at a black HBCU. Department of Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas, whose job it is to secure the border, went on MSNBC to echo Biden's comments. Uh, it tragically is, you know, um, in the terrorism context, domestic violent extremism is uh, our greatest threat uh, right now. I try telling that to the residents of Chicago's South Shore suburb, of whom 97 percent voted for Joe Biden. They're really hopping mad about dealing with all the illegals showing up on their streets because of Biden's policies, knocking long time residents out of housing wait lists. One community leader says he fears the illegals will <coughs> replace residents already there. Politically, having over 500 people in our community would completely wipe out any interest we have. Yeah. Are you aware that there are immigrant advocates at state houses all over this country right. who, are, who are advocating for non-citizen voting in local elections? What if that happened here? That would change the mindset of what we as a black community need to thrive here in Chicago. That's a concern of ours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and finally, self-awareness is not dead. Here's comedian James McCann. I regret having gotten the vaccine. <laughs> When the state told me to do something, I'd be the sort of person who said no. But it turns out I'm the sort of person who says, fine. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand what's going on. You're telling me it's important. Okay. I, and all they had to do was say, you won't be allowed to go into pubs for like a month. And I was like, put it in me. <laughs> That's what I'm upset about is that I had a principle temporarily. <laughs> 
I go, oh, if I was in Nazi Germany, I would have stood up to the regime. I wouldn't stand up to not being able to go to a pub for a month. I would have been like, Anne Frank, she's in that attic. There, I saw her. It doesn't matter what the point of principle was. The point is I would have been a chill. And that, I have to live with that for the rest of my three or four more years before I have a heart attack. And that's what happened while we were away. <laughs> Okay, let's get to the montage, shall we? Uh, first, in the overtime today, I told you we we're going to do this series of asking people on Twitter, uh, give us your one-word reaction to the possibility of this person or the, the actuality of this person running for president in 2024. Next up, we're going to be discussing what y'all had to say about Mike Pence, and you can probably guess it wasn't all that inspiring. We will nevertheless break it down. Might be hard to... Stretch this one out into a full 15 to 20 minutes. Seems pretty. Robbie knows going to help today. Okay, so. good, good, yeah, good, good. Because we might need two or three more guests, actually, because this one seems pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> but we'll follow through, nevertheless, uh, for Blaze TV subscribers at blazetv.com slash dace. Again, blazetv.com slash D-E-A-C-E. And that's where you can go to become a Blaze TV subscriber today for just $10 a month at blazetv.com dot com slash day. So, all right, let's get to the montage and 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 really the the big story is what transpired in Iowa over the weekend. So, um, my wife took Zoe on her on a senior trip uh, for graduation, and they went and got a hotel on the beach in Miami to just hang out and read books and shop and that kind of stuff, you know. And uh, Noah and I were here. Uh, back home in Iowa by ourselves, batching it. And I had a bunch of yard work to do this this weekend. Um, we're going to do Zoe's graduation party at the house. So I had to get some stuff I'd put off for too many years, taken care of in the yard and all that kind of stuff. And so Friday, I was kind of out of the loop um, after we got done with the show. Uh, Saturday, I was kind of out of the loop and uh, finishing things up. And then I'm like, you know what, man, I'm going to go to the movies. And so I went to, just to relax for a bit. And wanted to make sure my teenage son wasn't getting sick of me yet, you know. So I went to the movies for a few hours. I, I had, I'm totally oblivious to all this stuff going on. Totally oblivious. Go to see the movie. I, the movie I went and saw is Blackberry, which is very good, by the way. Might be the best movie I've seen so far this year. Um, and as I'm, as I'm, uh, yeah, before I went... Uh, to the movies, you know, I'm, I knew that there was some questionable weather in town and Saturday is typically the day I take my long five mile walk and get to, for, for my workout and get my, you know, podcast, my sports podcast to listen to, get caught up on those. And so I'm checking the radar and the weather the whole time to make sure it's okay to be out walking around and everything else. And it was clear, you know, so cloudy, but you know, radar was clear. So I got my five mile walk in, you know, come in, get showered, head to the movies, a uh, little light rain as I'm pulling into the movie theater, you know, I come out a couple hours later, bright sun and everything's dried up, which means that rain didn't last very long and the sun had been out for a while to pretty much dry everything up, you know, but you know, I'm still kind of wondering what the weather's like. I don't, I don't have a clue yet. Any of this is happening. I have no idea. And I'm looking at the weather. What's it going to be later? Cause uh, you know, it's my cheat day. And so am I going to have to, you know, that the weather may determine may determine what the cheat day dinner is. If it's going to be weather's going to be bad, we'll just have pizza delivered. You know these kinds of things. So you're doing a day off, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going through all this. I get back home, and I see all hell is breaking loose when I log on to Twitter because Trump canceled his rally, and I'm thinking, wow, for Trump to cancel a rally, weather has to be really bad. And like, I, I have no idea what's going on with these DeSantis events in other parts of the state. Northwest Iowa, for those who don't live here, it's like another state. That's where he was. I mean, it's a three, three and a half hour drive from where I live. I'm, I'm almost as close to, in fact, I am closer to Kansas City and almost as close to Minneapolis here in Des Moines as I am the part of Northwest Iowa that Ron DeSantis was spending a good deal of his time, Okay. That's the most Republican part of the state. It's not always been the most conservative. You know, like in, in 2008, Mike Huckabee lost up there, but we won central Iowa, and that's why we won that caucus. Mitt Romney won up there. 
but it's also where Steve King was congressman for a long time. So there, there is a, there is a lot of salt of the earth people up there, right? Mm-hmm. But it's you know the Des Moines. If you look at the Des Moines uh, media market. Like WHO's legendary signal, you will pick that up easier in Chicago, Illinois, than you will in Sioux City, Iowa, for example. They literally are a community unto themselves up there. So I have no idea what's going on. I'm not tuned in. And honestly, I'm just enjoying a day off. And I'm like, wow, for Trump to cancel a rally, it must be nuts outside. Or I I start checking the radar. It's completely clear. And I started logging on and I start seeing people's reactions to this. Now, you'll notice I never once shared any pictures of a a, a quote-unquote anemic crowd for Trump at his rally. Why? Because earlier in the day, Citizens Free Press, which is an outlet I like and have tweeted them out as a news aggregator many times for my account, they tweeted a picture of Pence and DeSantis together, and they said... Looks like these two guys are hanging out in Iowa and there's nobody there waiting for him. Then they had to pull that picture because that picture was actually from 2020 when they were here for the presidential campaign. That was in Florida. And it was actually not even in Iowa. You're right. It was was, in Florida. Was giving Pence a few tips on how to reopen. Yes, that's right. That's right. Other than that. So, I mean, it wasn't even close to, it was completely a fabricate. And so I'm just like, I. No, I'm I'm not. I'm not sharing any of those photos. I don't believe in any of them. Okay. Do I believe that Donald Trump canceled his event because of weather? Yes. Do I believe that he canceled his event because the crowd was going to not reach his expectations? Yes. And we don't have the population base. I did a TV interview right before our show about an hour ago. And I mentioned this. We, we don't have the population base in Iowa for the 30, 40,000 person rallies that Trump holds. We don't. That doesn't mean he wouldn't draw that in Iowa. You know, I, I, am, I, I just want to say to both sides here, be very careful about uh, most of this has been the Trump team trying to end this primary before it starts. And I keep saying yeah, I wouldn't do that. I also wouldn't bury Trump either prematurely. There are still 30 counties in the state that voted for Obama once or twice that voted for him twice. He is very popular here. The problem is, crowd-sized him. Remember, this was the first argument of the entire Trump presidency. As he trotted Sean Spicer out there to argue about how many people were at his inauguration compared to Obama's. Remember, that was Mm -hmm. the first argument of his entire presidency. That's important to him. He's a showman. He's a presenter. He's got a little Carney to him, a little, you know, P.T. Barnum to him. Gotta have a crowd. That matters a lot. So... There would have been, I think, a pretty large drive-up crowd. You know, we're within a a six- to eight-hour drive from Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas City, Minneapolis. Do I, I, I think there would have been a lot of people that would, that would not have been Iowa caucus voters that love President Trump that would have driven here for that event, probably looked at the radar and this trail of storms everywhere and said, I don't want to brave that, so I'm not going to do it. And I think that's the reason for the weather cancellation. According to the FAA, FAA, there was not one single weather-related delay at the Des Moines International Airport on Saturday. The Iowa Cubs, Cubs played their baseball game Saturday night. I think it was a fear that the drive-up crowd that he would need in a, in a sparsely populated state like Iowa, the drive-up crowd he would need to have the visual he wants, just wasn't going to happen with the weather. And they they could have just simply said that the problem with saying that is it implies that that you need a drive up crowd to 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 create that kind of an atmosphere from out of state you see what i'm saying so you don't want to do that and then you just end up saying a bunch of dumb stuff and now you're putting someone like me who largely did not care and wasn't paying attention to this but when you start lying and gaslighting me I just have a reflex to respond. I can't ever let it go. And there's a, I see, I've seen this in politics a million times. Campaigns are like sporting events. You're never undefeated. You're good at take L's. Sometimes it's not going to be your day. You're going to step on rakes. You're going to face plant. You're going to make mistakes. Don't gaslight people that they're not watching the game 
that they know they're watching. Like when they turn it on and they see you're down by 20 points, don't tell them, we're not really down by 20 points. Game just started. Don't. There's a reason why a lot of great coaches in those situations will bench their best players and say, you know what? Let's just live to fight another day and not put any more tread on those tires. No point wasting energy, risking injury. This, this one's lost and we're getting the hell out of here, okay? And we're coming back stronger and forgetting about this, burning the tape and we're coming back stronger tomorrow. Instead, you could do what, what, what the Trumpistas did on Twitter, which make it even worse. Just say ridiculous stuff and just keep digging yourself a hole because fearless leader can't ever be wrong. And he didn't have to be wrong. Just simply say, hey, I'm going to draw people from all over the country, all over the Midwest that probably don't want to drive in that kind of weather. So we'll come back again another time. See ya. That's it. Could have just done that. That Nope. No. The, uh, dystopian tornado warnings. Sirens. I mean, people sending out radar from 50, 100, 200 miles away. Some of you are still sending me these shots. Fearless leader can be wrong because everybody's wrong. Unless you're in a cult, then cult leader can't be wrong. I think I saw a flyover of the ghost of Kiev as well. I think that happened. <laughs> They, this was completely ego-driven bumbling. And it, it's, this, it's the Saul David analogy I have used. This is, the, this is Saul-esque. Now, now, DeSantis still has to take advantage of it. And for his team to, at the last minute, pivot to do an event that's not scheduled... At a part of Des Moines, first of all, Des Moines is not a Republican town anyway. That part of Des Moines, certainly not a Republican part of town. They, they picked a popular barbecue joint, but this is like their smallest restaurant in the city. I mean, I, I went just to see what would happen. I was, I was blown away by how many people came to this. And it was literally, you're within minutes of walking to where Trump was supposed to be. See, those are the kinds of instincts we just never had on the cruise campaign. Very impressive to see the DeSantis people have those instincts and pull that off completely on their own. I know some of you think that like, like I am like secretly the voice, the Charlie's Angels voice. Secretly the Phantom Menace behind the scenes stealthily guiding this actually i just ordered some godfather's pizza with noah we we're getting ready to play jedi survivor and call it a night and i got a text from someone on the desantis campaign the governor would like to finally get a chance to meet you we're going to do this impromptu event at jethro's barbecue on park avenue in des moines if you want to make it we're going to be there in an hour i asked noah hey you want to go meet governor desantis He's like yeah that's your sinister backstory Yes, I am plotting and moving pieces on the board. Actually, I just finished a piece of pizza and I was going to play Star Wars on my PS5 with my kid. <laughs> I was basically wearing boxer shorts. Had to go find some jeans and jumped in the truck and drove across town. Here's the lesson of this. Because it also ties into the far more devastating, actually, is the headline this morning. That, that, that Trump is attacking DeSantis for being too pro-life. How do you go from the guy that overturned Roe to let me lose an entire nomination fight on the issue that I have the biggest win in the history of the issue with? How does, how does stuff like this happen? This is why I kept telling you, don't look at polls. Ask President Giuliani what, he, what to think of May polls, April polls, March polls. That's why they play the games. Let's play this out. That to, really, that's really the big headline of this weekend. Iowa basically said this weekend, if y'all don't mind, we're going to go ahead and have the caucuses anyway. Let's see what happens. We're not going to pay much attention to your, let's call the game before it starts. And no, it's not over because... We, Trump ran over some airhead on CNN with a 14 IQ. No, it's not over. It's not even really started. It kind of just started now. So let's play it out. Let's see what happens. 
because I didn't have on my bingo card Trump saying DeSantis is too pro-life. That one I didn't have. That anybody else did. Why does that matter? Well, guess who also has a six-week ban on killing kids? Iowa does. <laughs> Iowa happens to have one. It's called a heartbeat bill. And that usually shows up embryonically in, in, in legislation like Iowa's at six weeks. Guess who else has a six-week ban? South Carolina does. Same thing. Embryonic heart activity. Usually about six weeks. Huh. Our governor was just up for re-election, right? Correct. After she did this legislation that you, is, that's supposedly so impossible you can't win with, right? Right. She won by 18 points? She did. She did, yeah. Won by 18 points. A lot of pro-life people vote in Iowa? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of them do. Yeah. So, what's happening here? And it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. But it's going to. On the trajectory we're on. Donald Trump is allowing his ego which is but hurt that the young buck would dare challenge him. I look, the the Daniel Penny answer he gave over the weekend was really anemic. Why did he do that? Well because Ron DeSantis came out and gave out the give send go and urge people to donate and the giving for that uh, for the, for that uh, travesty of miscarriage of justice multiplied by like 20 in a few hours. What's happening is he refuses, he, he, he demands to differentiate himself from DeSantis on virtually everything. And what's happening now, though, is because DeSantis has actually governed. See, I, the Cruz campaign, we'd never governed. It was all projection. So Trump could get to our right and be perceived as the most right candidate because other than a filibuster, Cruz had done really nothing substantive as a senator, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, DeSantis has a record. So, De so Trump is not acting, reacting to DeSantis' comments on the life issue, but his policy. And therefore, in order to differentiate himself from DeSantis, does he move right or left? Left. He's now moving left. Making Romney-like Romney arguments. This is unelectable. This is unelectable. Yes, sir, please, uh, lecture me. Le lecture the guy that just won Florida by 20 points on electability. We're listening, go. Uh, please, lecture uh, the governor of Iowa who just won re-election by 18 points, signing what, what was, at the time, the toughest abortion law in America. Uh, we're listening. Roll tape. You're watching Trump hurt himself unnecessarily, and it's all out of ego. And this gets back to worldview and transactionalism. For a while, it was a nice relationship. His self-interest aligned with yours. Now the question is, is that still the case? If we're going to just move left on issues... Why? Well, I'm, like if I was running Trump's campaign, you know, I do. I'd be like, really appreciate that Ron DeSantis was able to take advantage of President Trump's victory against Roe versus Wade by signing that pro-life legislation. Wouldn't have been possible without what President Trump did with Roe v. Wade. Instead, it's, well, that's too extreme. You're literally handing the other side, you're handing baby killers talking points. You're shooting your own soldiers on an issue that you already won that if you are the nominee, you won't get any credit for showing any moderation for in a general election anyway. Never underestimate the fragility of the male ego. And this weekend, you got a taste of why I've been using the Saul David analogy, because you watched it play out in real time.
If you are looking for options for your child's education, first of all, if you're not, what's wrong with you? Um, but if, if you are looking for alternatives to government school indoctrination, uh, check out our friends at Freedom Project Academy right now. They've perfected online learning, offering live, on-demand homeschool courses in a real-time classroom environment with an individual teacher built on Judeo-Christian values, classical curriculum. What does that mean? Well, it means essentially getting educated the way the founding generations of the country were, uh, learning uh, how to master subject matter, not how to be mastered and become subjects after leaving school. Uh, it means learning how to think, not what to think. I uh, had my own son Noah enrolled in FPA for a couple of years, so I've seen up close and personal how they operate. Also know the people who helped start the school. We were co-combatants uh, co uh, against Common Core back in the day all right so if you want to save 10 percent on your tuition you can right now if you enroll today at freedom for school the preposition not the number for freedom for school.com is where you want to go that's freedom for school.com now you might be thinking hey sounds enticing i don't want to get married before we even have a first date can i at least get some more information you bet Get a free information packet as well when you go to freedomforschool.com. Again, freedomforschool.com. Let's welcome in our good friend, Bob Vanderplatz from The Family Leader. Good to see you, brother. How are you? Doing really well. Good to see you as well. So now it sort of feels like it felt like about a month or so ago when RFK announced and some other, and some other stuff that the, the, nomin the, the, the primary cycle really truly got going. This weekend, doesn't it feel as if, though, that for really the Iowa caucuses officially got going? It ramped up in a big way. And if I could pick one headline from the whole weekend, I mean, we can get into storm chasers. Uh, we can get into the whole thing. All right. But to me, really, the headline was, to quote the formerly great Chris Berman, that's why they play the games. I mean, <laughs> the headline, I think, coming out of this weekend is, if you guys don't mind, we're going to go ahead and have the Iowa caucuses anyway, and let's just see how it all plays out. I think that's kind of the headline to me. What do you think? I think it is. And uh, first of all, uh, the state was really ramped up. I mean, they were excited to welcome Florida's governor, Governor Ron DeSantis, into Iowa. First of all, up in northwest Iowa with Randy Feenstra, uh, who's a congressman out of the 4th District, the most Republican area in the entire state. And from what I'm told, they had about 700 people show up for the, for the governor of Florida. And he got a, a great reception. And then he flew on over to Cedar Rapids for another event that the, the party hosted for him. And then uh, the former president, Donald Trump, was supposed to show up kind of in our neighborhood, Steve, at Waterworks Park in Des Moines. And there was a lot of tornado activity, that type of thing. There were there were storm forecasts, but he chose not to come. There's some uh, disagreement if it was because of crowd size <laughs> or if it was actually because of the storms. But then DeSantis, picking up on that, thought, you know what? They're still allowing air traffic in and out of Des Moines. Why not fly into Des Moines and go to where he was supposed to be just a, a few blocks away? And so went to uh, Jethro's Barbecue on the south side and had about 300 people in like a 90-minute notice. And they show up to greet the governor of Florida. So I think the Iowa caucuses are game on, and that is why we play the game. One of the things that perplexes me is... And I've seen this, and it'll be fascinating, the first chance, the opportunity that the DeSantis people take an L, whether they make the same mistake. Sure. But the, in a, the unwillingness to know when you've lost and to take the L, right? And I used a sports analogy. You're a big sports guy. And there are days, it's just not your day. Just got beat. You, you just got beat. Got, got ambushed. Regroup. You got stepped on a rake, yep. right? And a lot of times the coach will take his best players out when it's clear that it's over, no, no, in, no point in risking further injury to add to the insult of what's already on the scoreboard. And let's just get this thing over with, get the hell out of here, and move on as quick as we possibly can to the next game. That's why they say right? to live to play another day. Exactly. Instead, fearless leader can't be wrong. Like, I, I don't know. I, I couldn't understand why they didn't just say, hey, we were going to have a lot of people drive in from Missouri, Illinois, Minnesota. Kansas to come see the former president and probably don't want to be driving through those storm fronts. So we'll come back another time. Thanks. It's, it's just, oh, the, the tornado sirens, dystopian. I mean, it was everywhere. Not, there wasn't a single flight delayed, according to the FAA at uh, Des Moines International Airport all day Saturday. Well, not only Iowa that. Cubs played anyway. They, and, and then they, people sending out like radar 
of places 200 miles from here. I mean, it was just, uh, it, it was mind numbing the unwillingness to just move on and take the L, which I thought actually is, was helping their opponent all the more. Yeah. And if you're like us and you live in the Midwest, uh, storms are something you have to deal with. I mean, we, we just deal with those type of storms. And what I would say, though, is that typically for a Trump rally, 8 o'clock in the morning, he's expecting thousands of people already lining up. And there just wasn't that number lining up. Waterworks Park was kind of bare. It was kind of empty. And I think it just was a combination of the storms have got, are giving us a good out uh, so that we're not embarrassed. So, therefore, we're going to pop the clutch and we'll, we'll come back another time. To me, the bigger story, well, there maybe not bigger, because a lot of times with Trump, it, 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 with the positions he takes on issues are almost irrelevant. I mean, there's a, there is a, he's not an ideologically driven figure, never has been. There is no Trumpism ideology. There's a Trumpism as a brand. Well, the ideology okay? is Donald Trump. That's exactly right. He's just yeah. a singular brand. And that's why stories like, I may have canceled an event to avoid a diminished crowd size, hurt him in ways that they would not hurt other people. And then things where he takes unconventional positions against his own base on certain things don't hurt him as much as they would hurt, say, somebody else. Mm -hmm. Except for like maybe one issue that happens to be, you know, the seventh rail uh, for a lot of Republican primary voters, particularly in Iowa. And and I, I, I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around Trump's pro-life messaging and strategy. It, it, I understand when you get close to 80 years old, your memory is just not what it used to be. He knows this is a primary, right? I would hope he does. Yeah, he, he understands. Unless say, he believes he, he, he's already won the primary. I mean, I, I, listen, I'm going I'm to be 50 this summer, and sometimes I find myself even live on the air. My prodigious photographic memory isn't as sharp as it was 10 years ago. So I can't even imagine what it's like when you're 80, yeah. okay? So maybe he just forgot that this is a primary. And out there doing your Eric Fenstrom, Romney campaign, etch-a-sketch for how I'm going to completely pivot in the general on, a, on the abortion issue. Well, we can even discuss that that's frankly dumb. You're the guy that overturned Roe. There is not a single pro-abortion pro pro -abortion voter that's going to ever forgive you for that because of some nuanced position you have now. Yeah. And you're taking okay? credit for it. Yes. You're taking credit that you overturned Roe. So now he wants to have this, you know, uh, DeSantis' uh, pro-life legislation in Florida, uh, it's too strict. It's virtually exactly what Iowa's heartbeat bill is when you do the math on embryonic heart detection, it's which our governor just won by 18 points in the last yeah. election. wasn't too strict for her to win. It's virtually the exact heartbeat bill that they passed in South Carolina back in 2021 or 22, I think it was. I, I don't understand this and, I, and, and because I think logic's out the window here. I think we're in full on Saul rage, Saul raging, and he just has to take the opposite position of what DeSantis literally says on everything, as opposed to just saying, yeah, it was good that DeSantis got to pass that pro-life bill because he wouldn't have been able to do it without me killing Roe v. Wade as president. Can't bring himself to do that. And so it like he gave a really weak answer on the Daniel Penny thing in New York over the weekend after DeSantis came out and and tweeted support this guy and give to his uh, his crowdfunding yeah. uh, defense. It just seems like whatever like there's there's evidence today of Trump's Twitter army scrubbing their previous pro-life tweets in order to align with what he's saying about the issue now. It just seems like whatever position DeSantis is going to take, he's going to take the opposite one. And the problem with that, though, is he's not running against Ted Cruz, whose only legislative accomplishment was a filibuster in the minority. So whenever he differentiates himself from DeSantis, who has gotten pretty much to the right of anybody in 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 public office, you end up having to go to the left. Am I, I, I just think this is all just ego at this point. No, you're exactly right. Matter of fact, the words that Trump used wasn't too strict. The words he used was too harsh. Right. And the pro-life community, I mean, what do you mean it's too harsh? You know, that baby in the mother's womb, she's a baby. She deserves a birthday and you're going to, you're okay to wipe her out. That's pretty harsh. A heartbeat bill where there's two separate heartbeats, that's not too harsh because we know that child or that, that little girl in her mother's womb, she's definitely a baby. The problem is, Steve, you go back to Trump being on his pro-life deal. Uh, before he ran for president, he was pro-choice. He was adamantly pro-choice. 
Then he made a deal, and he made a deal with these are the justices I'm going to appoint, and the justices I'm going to appoint would overturn Roe v. Wade. So he gets elected. He appoints three of those justices, so he kept his word. They overturn Roe v. Wade. He's on CNN going, you know, I'm the president who overturned Roe v. Wade. Well, what does that mean? That means I'm ready to make a deal that'll be great for everybody. Make a deal for what? And he said, allow the states to, to have this argument. But he as the president. He would be able now to make a deal that'd be great for everybody. So DeSantis, Governor Reynolds, they pass heartbeat legislation because of what we already talked about. Two separate heartbeats. You have, a, you have two separate human beings. You can't kill one of them. And now he's saying that's too harsh. That comes on the heels of him throwing the pro-life community under the bus in the 2022 election for the dismal midterm midterm turnout. And instead of taking responsibility for that. So he's been throwing the pro-life community under the bus. And Steve, as you said, this is the third rail of Iowa politics. You do that. And that's why I said in my tweet, Iowa just had the caucus gate flung wide open. They're going to be open to anybody who has a consistent, consistently pro-life message and has the credentials to back it up. And it so happens to be that Governor DeSantis has that. So I did talk to some people that uh, within my nexus around the state who saw the governor. And interest of full disclosure, I did get a chance to talk to him at that event in Des Moines for about 10 minutes. Me, my son, his wife, Casey, and him privately. And I would say nine and a half of those minutes were about their newfound love for Casey's Breakfast Pizza, which is a popular <laughs> convenience store chain in Iowa, and my son's upcoming vars- first varsity football season. So mm. literally nothing of substance was discussed in that entire conversation. So yeah, I, uh, Casey's Breakfast Pizza well, is a substance. It, 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 it is, if you've had it. Yeah, yes. it, it, it will add some <laughs> substance to you as well. Uh, but um, looking, talking to people that I know, and I mean, I was looking for, hey, I mean, give me some constructive criticism, things of that nature. Here are the two things that I heard the most. Uh, One, don't speak from notes. Um, He was surprisingly good actually working the crowd. They had heard the opposite, okay? That he actually did well working the crowd. They expected more from the stump. That it was the opposite of what they thought. They thought he'd be electric from the stump and then maybe more wooden with the crowd. He was actually very good with the crowd and spoke too much from notes on the stump. The other thing was um, unleash... Casey, everywhere you go, uh, absolute asset. Um, I mean, she basically should should live in Iowa. Now, she's got yeah. small kids at home and can't. But I, those were the two things that I heard the most in terms of reviews about him beyond the policy. What kind of a presence does he cast? Yeah. What are your thoughts? Well, a couple things. And I'll say in full disclosure, uh, last week, Monday, the reason I wasn't on your show is that Darla and I were having lunch with Governor DeSantis and Casey in Tallahassee at the governor's mansion. And we spent a solid two and a half hours there. And one as I'd say, Steve, is that we came away saying this couple is very focused. Uh, they're very likable. They, they know what it is they want to do. I would agree with you. Casey has a compelling story, and she is a compelling asset of his as they go around trying to work up votes. And we know in Iowa that's extremely important that if you're a team in doing that. Uh, and I think, you know, this was his first outing, especially at uh, Randy Feinstress's a uh, place where he probably did speak from notes. That's pretty typical. We've seen that before, Bobby Jindal and the likes. But as the, as the person matures as a candidate, it becomes more and more from the heart. And that's when they really draw the connection and make him really good. But I heard the same type of thing is that, you know, kind of uh, uh, discard the notes, but you're really, really good one-on-one. And Casey's definitely an asset. But I think also there, Stephen, I talked to them about that. I think America is hungering today to say we want to look up to our president to our first lady and tell our kids to tell our grandkids grow up to be like them and we need role models today and i think they'd be a good role model as a couple could you see a dynamic last question carrie lake's very popular here native iowan you know i like carrie lake she's already been here for trump a couple of times sure i could see her doing more campaign stops in iowa the next year than trump it won't work but could you see it, it, it we'll, that was your well i hadn't even thought whether sure. it would work or not but if i were the desantis campaign i'd just send casey out to counter that yeah i mean you can send carry out all you want but half half of the the issue in the iowa cox is you have to show up the reason trump not showing up to his rally was such a big deal you got to show up you got people showing up there you got to show up for them um and it's a compelling field. I mean, I mean, you got Ron DeSantis, but you got Nikki Haley, you got Tim Scott, you got Mike Pence, you got Asa Hutchinson. There's going to be more voices than Vivek Ramaswamy. You got more voices in this deal. 
Uh, Trump is going to have to show up himself. He cannot keep giving passes. And that's why we think our leadership summit, which comes up on July 14th, that he's going to have to be there. You can't keep giving that base away or people like DeSantis are going to take advantage of that base. All right. Quick follow up. Could you see him try and do what Romney did in 2012? Never really campaign here. Try to have a stealth candidacy. See if he could still have no expectations. Still find a way to steal it. Remember caucus night, Romney was actually certified the winner and then they ended up uh, rewarding it to Rick Santorum Santorum later. Could you see him attempt a strategy like that? Well, he could attempt that. I think what happened on Saturday night is he found out that he's playing against at least one of them who's who's not going to let him get away with that. Because basically what DeSantis did without saying it, he came to the place where Trump was supposed to give his message and basically planted a sign about you can run, but you cannot hide. You know, we're going to be here everywhere. And that will win in Iowa. And I'm telling you what, if that wins in Iowa, it's going to be game on to the nomination. True or false, DeSantis has to win Iowa or New Hampshire. I think whoever the alternative Trump is, so if that's going to be a DeSantis or any other one, I believe you have to win Iowa or you have to beat the odds now where you come really, really close, then I think it's game on. I think that Trump, for, if Trump is the nominee, it was a blitzkrieg, meaning that he that he either won one of the two early states or both, and then essentially locked this thing up in South Carolina. Totally agree. If Trump doesn't win, then someone else won one, if not both of the early states, and then had the structure in place when we get into more television primaries and Super Tuesday and beyond, that they were able to win more of a, of a long, drawn-out fight. Yep. Totally agree. So Iowa and New Hampshire are both crucially important. I would say Iowa's more important, and obviously I'm biased. However, you go into South Carolina, and if you've got Nikki and Tim Scott both still in the race, uh, that could be a divider as well that allows somebody to come up in between Uh, to take out the former president because the former president is very strong in South Carolina. But again, this is why I have told you guys for months and months and months and months. None of these polls matter. No. When I signed on with Huckabee and Cruz, (laughs) they were at 2%, man. And it was later in the year than May. Let's go ahead and play the games and let's just see what happens. Play the game. And and you know what? This may just be a one week error and Trump comes back stronger and wipes the floor with these people. Cool. Then hey, he's ready. He's ready for he's ready for prime time. Then let's yeah. go. Yeah, you know, I was okay. just gonna say that, Steve. This week, you look in the rearview mirror. DeSantis won this week. Trump got defeated big time this week, and that was after a CNN gift mm-hmm. to him. Mm-hmm. He got defeated big time this week. We'll see what the others can do and what the former president can do as well. Thank you, man. All right, God Your, bless. You same to you. Your questions are next. Stay tuned. And greetings. We are back with our two live and on demand here on Blaze TV, radio and podcast. Steve Dace here alongside Totters and Aaron McIntyre, all of you. And all of you can at some point in time, hopefully not at the same time, let us know what you think about what we think via the SteveDace.com inbox, which you can take advantage of by emailing the show, Steve at SteveDace.com. That's D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook, MeWe, and Gab. You can follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, Getter, Instagram, and TikTok, and you can find me on Truth Social. Well, you can try to find me on Truth Social at Real Steve Dace there. And for those of you that listen to the podcast, thank you so very much. Uh, We appreciate you. Please, if you wouldn't mind, show your appreciation for us. Click that subscribe or follow button. Hit uh, hit us up with a five-star review as well. Thank you to all of you that have done that. If you want to embed a question for a future Ask Me Anything into your five-star review, you'll go to the front of the line for consideration the next time we do one of these, and Todd sits down to decide which questions we will be answering. Speaking of the Ask Me Anything, it is brought to you by our friends over at Relief Factor. Everyone deals with chronic pain from time to time. What what do I mean by chronic pain? I mean, that's usually pain that you are enduring from too much inflammation in the body. If you've got a clinical issue, that means you need professional medical care. If you've got a chronic issue, that means you need something like Relief Factor. It is drug-free, though it is created by doctors who can prescribe drugs, and it attacks the inflammation in your body that is likely likely producing the chronic pain in your joints that you're struggling with. If you want to see, if you don't see a difference in three weeks or less, find out why about 70% of the people who do try the three-week quick start end up sticking with it because of the results that they see when they 
Try the three-week quick start for just $20 at relieffactor.com. That's relieffactor.com or call 800-4-RELIEF. That's 800-4-RELIEF. All right, it's time for Ask Me Anything. Todd has selected the questions. Aaron has said questions. Let us begin. All right, we will begin with this from Ash Mason. I believe this is not one that we got to last week. Was Emperor Constantine making it the official religion of Rome, Christianity, the worst thing that happened to Christianity? Well, A, it's an impossible to answer question. Because we don't know what the outcome would have been without Constantine's much historically debated conversion. We, we don't know. Except this. This is what we do know. Whether Constantine is, was sincerely converted or not, not even the gates of hell prevail against the church. And Christ is the ruler of God's creation. All authority under heaven and earth has been granted unto him. And that would have been how the story would have gone and the story would have ended with or without a Constantine. I'm not saying questions like this are not important. I'm just saying that they should not take the place of, how do I put this? Apostles, not assassins, Stephen. Apostles, not assassins. That's why I had to hesitate because I wanted to answer like an assassin. <laughs> so let me try answering like an apostle. Okay. Um, the prime directive of Christianity is the proclamation of Christ. We, we should be very hesitant to have a conversation involving Christianity that detracts from that. I'm not saying that in an, in an imperfect world, we will always get to have the conversation in the way that we want it to have. I'm not, I know that that's not the case. I'm just saying that we should be very selective about when we permit that premise to be altered. And I, I don't think that this particular question meets that threshold. Thoughts? That's interesting. It is file under uh, apostles, not assassins. I mean, I think... For example, let me just give you an example. Let's say you believe Constantine's conversion was not sincere and that he just viewed this as an opportunity to take advantage of the swelling ranks of Christians within the empire to further his, um, his agenda. Let's forget that he called the Council of Nicaea to deal with one of the first great heretics of church history. Let's, 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 let's claim he did all of that insincerely, just for the sake of argument, all right? Do you believe one less person would have been saved from their sins? I don't. I, I don't, do you think that the, the trajectory of Christianity would have, w there wouldn't have been another Constantine-like figure then? Another, let's, let's say you, he is the cynical figure that maybe your question presumes. Okay, so you don't fall for the canard this time. Wouldn't have fallen for the canard the next time or a, a century later or another character? You see what I'm saying? There, there is an ebb and flow here to the competing forces for dominion on this earth. And whatever your view is of Constantine, he is but, he is merely a player on the stage of that drama, depending on which side of the drama he is on. But that's not where the drama truly is. It's what's going on in the unseen realm. Is that a better answer? Oh, I'm not, I, I was fascinated by it. I do think that it, in laying out, there's a lot of potentially false premises uh, and you hit on a couple of them. One that I think is it, it, it didn't actually become the f official religion. There was the Edict of Milan, which mm -hmm. gave it 
this, it put it on the same standing as mm-hmm. all the pagan religions, but it didn't make it the, the <clears throat> he didn't make it the official religion. It was his religion, and obviously he's the emperor, so in that time that means something. But it, uh, he just actually elevated out of the out of the catacombs and gave it equal standing. For people that are like, what the hell does this matter, and who is Constantine? <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm I'm trying to remember the story. You you're gonna know it better than me. But he was in the midst of battle, right? Mm-hmm. And claims he received a vision mm-hmm. um, from from above, an epiphany that that said to fight in the name of the Lord or yeah. something like that, right? right, right? right. Yeah. And the fight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and um, and that essentially led to his conversion to Christianity. Uh, yes, and because it did inspire uh, an actual victory, then his legions began fighting with uh that uh, insignia the white cross i believe it was mm-hmm. I, and i could be wrong about that and okay. you know we we go on from there and a lot of people will view this as historically it is viewed as one of the major turning points of christianity's ascendancy in the west because rome was the most powerful force in the west at the time and it had gone from within about a 400 year period here, this is about what 400 years after Christ, right? Mm -hmm. So in about a 400 year period here, it had come, it had gone from the persecution of Christianity to an endorsement of it. Yes. Okay. And did, was that, would, would Christianity have been better off remaining, you know, in, in, in the ideological ghetto? Would it have been more, sincere would it have been more have more integrity without all that mainstream acceptance it's funny i had forgotten i i pulled this question a week ago before the before the last two weekends transpired and each of the last two weekends i won't name them but this evangelical pastor uh he is said i'm dead in my sins as a catholic and has been sending me videos and all this stuff but one of the things and now interestingly enough is there apparently there is well he apparently has this belief that the the early church uh was actually the church but then it got all romanized and believes that like it's an entirely different thing post this so this Worlds are colliding here. A question I picked without that context now has that context going in. And there is a belief that uh, as of like 500 AD, already the church looked nothing like it did when it was underground. Now, in many ways, that's actually correct because you're not hiding. You can, I mean, but I, the, I, I'm, I'm honestly struck that... People believe how quickly, like, something was just apparently made up after managing to survive through blood and toil. They just gave it up and said, yeah, let's go with the fake stuff now. I don't, I, so anyways, that's why I, 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 Is this the longest Constantine conversation that's ever been had? Not just in the history of this program, but in the history of Blaze Media, or really any media that anybody actually listens to. It's way more than constant. We're 2,000 years into this thing. We could talk about, we did this with the Reformation, pick points of history where we, we still, it's your point. What's the truth, Steve? Mm-hmm. Like you talk about the media, like I can't, we can't even get to like a point. We still are very much that way just in terms of what the faith is. 2,000 years in. I agree. And that's, and that's why I'm a, I, uh, that's why I'm sola scriptura. I just, I'm just going to go with the word of God and you guys that, can that, all have your other side show arguments if you want. I, I, I don't know how to possibly prosecute them. I don't know how to pros- possibly adjudicate them. And and it'll just put me in a, a tribe that I may or may not even understand who they are or what they even believe. Just that's why I'm just, what's the word of God say? Everything else is arguable. But that's what's fascinating. There, there's, there's a guy right down the street who says the same thing. I'm Sola Scriptura. And he has a different take on what that means than you do. Yeah, but... <laughs> he wants to argue with you about something that is not sola scriptura. He wants to argue with you about the veracity of a historical event from 1500 years ago. I don't. I mean, I'll have an opinion on it if you want, you know, but ultimately it doesn't alter my belief one way or the other in a single word of the Bible, whether Constantine's, um, I, 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 I guess my point is I don't need, I don't have, you know, I'll just say it very bluntly. I'm not here to prove 
any particular tribe's claims on an exclusive or primary um, point of accuracy or supremacy over the others. I'm here to bring a biblical worldview into the mainstream. That's what I'm here to do. And arguing about the sincerity of Constantine's conversion 1,600 years ago doesn't get me there at any level. Uh, next up, Andrew Moore asks, do you want Anna to ask you any more questions about the purge? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Um, nice. That's a, what, a, what a segue. Yeah. I loved that. I That's great. That could only yeah. happen on this show. Kenny Thormanson says, true or false, Christianity is not a religion, but being a Christian is living in reality? Uh, I would say false. Uh, Christianity is a religion. It's a unique one. It's a religion of relationship. But that relationship, one of the ways that it is demonstrated and shown is by, is by participating in ritual and worship according to what God commands and deserves. Even if you are a Protestant, you are engaging in at least two of those rituals, baptism and communion. So I, I don't, I've never understood the argument, hey, we have an ecclesiology, we have a liturgy, we have creeds, we have dogmas, but we're not a religion, okay? Um, that's a catchphrase to me. Now, I understand that it's a unique religion. It's a religion predicated on a real relationship with the, the living God of the universe, which is different from every other point of religion. And that's what Paul is alluding to in Philippians, I think it is, where he uses a Greek slang word that can even be interpreted at times to be a crass term for feces when he says religion is trash or bunk or, or poop. Okay, and there's a Greek slang word there that sometimes that is translated into a, a, uh, a word that we may use for a slang to describe human excrement. Okay, but, but he is talking about the idea of these man-made or demonically inspired systems of earning God's approval. Even the Old Testament system in ancient Israel was one of relationship. You showed you were in relationship with the only living God of the universe by, by following through on the, the, the worship and the ritual that he was worthy of. Even that was relation, relational in, in nature. All right. There's even a point of the Old Testament where God says, I desire relationship, not sacrifice. Meaning that you have, re you have practiced reductionism. You have, you have taken my system of relational worship and reduced it into a rote system of, I can disobey and go my own way and do whatever I want. And if I just kill the right amount of pigeons on the right said holiday, my sins are forgiven. That's not what this is. Right? It's, yesterday was Mother's Day. Call, call mom up. Hey, mom. Happy Mother's Day. Talk to you next year. That's the only time you called her all year long. It was very clear. You just checked a box, right? Mm -hmm. Your heart really in it. She feeling that relationship. Mom feel honored. Mom feel loved. No, you just checked the box and went back to whatever you were doing. It was about you, not about mom. It was used day and you knew her like, I better call mom or she could have called me and then they'll never get off the phone. So let me just get this over with. And then we'll do it again next year. Maybe that's about you. It's not about her in a relationship. You make it about the other party and the other party makes it about you. And then each side is mutually fulfilled by the other mutually loved and respected by the other. So in this one, God sends you his son to atone for your sins that you can't atone for on your own and then allows that and then and then gives you the 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 the, the blessing, the glory of, of his son now living with you, the hope of glory, Christ in me. So that you can now be in a right relationship with him. How do you respond? By living as best you can in accordance with that reality. 
by letting that reality live through you and worshiping and acknowledging God in worship and ritual as he deserves. That's a relationship. It's not, all right, yeah, you know, banged all my concubines last week. Day of atonement. Hand me the right, the, hand me the, uh, the unblemished lamb. I'll take it down to the temple there in Jerusalem. Slit its throat at three o'clock. Then back to my concubines. That's not the way it works. There's no relationship there. That's the roteness of religion, which is what is most of religion. Do these, commit, fulfill the five pillars of Islam. Except you do that and you're still actually not sure you get to go to paradise because there are no divine guarantees in the, in the Quran. There are in the Hadith. There are Hadiths that tell you that if you die in the cause of jihad, you'll go to paradise. But there is no divine certainty in the Quran. You don't know. And so the, 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 it is a religion. It's just a religion of relationship. Is it a religion? Is it a relationship? It's a religion of relationship. Christianity doesn't conform to these binary choices. Christianity is a third way. It's a different way. It is the way. Or it's not. It's the way or it's no way. But it's not any way in between. Next question. You want to do any more uh, Catholicism stuff? We have more. Is there a reason you picked all these out? Are you uh, now? I got to ask you. Do you got an axe to grind? No, because did, did you pick all these? I asked you off the air today. Is there like something in evangelical circles these days that I like? This has come up again, like I, because it was just there, like all of a sudden, and no, I thought I'm missing I, something. I, 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 and I think I told you off the air. I I avoid much of evangelical subculture. It repulses me. I I, I honestly don't honestly know what is going on with an evangelical I, subculture. Most I honestly of the time. go in and I just try to find if there's themes. I often will elevate them, and like that's why I said it was a very interesting. And you obviously can take these in any number of directions. And I like I and the audience. Let me, let me tell you something. Let me let me say something out loud that I have said to you privately many times. We're all papists. All the Protestant, oh, the Protestants are too. Most cases, just my papacy is at the Southern Baptist Convention. It's in, uh, it's at Colorado. It's in Colorado Springs. We all want to be led and followed. We all do. I mean, we're really only arguing about who's the right and proper lineage and what is the right and proper organi- organizational structure and ecclesiastical structure to follow. I mean, the Protestants don't create so many denominations over and over and over again. Because they are, they're not joiners, but because they are. You lost me. You went another way, so let me join something else. And this time it'll work. No, it won't. I'm actually sola scriptura. I don't care about joining your group. I don't. What I care about is, does it align with the word of God? If it does, then man, I don't care if you call yourselves, surely I'm in. If it doesn't, I don't. And I don't care what you call yourselves. My answer is no. No, I just want to know why everybody's on. T- I mean, people come to right to our show all the time, and they're actually complimentary of how we bring these worlds together. How you actually chose to hire me for several reasons, but one of them is because I was Catholic and bringing that perspective. Yeah. So I, I, I genuinely now want to know if there's jo- is there something in the water lately that brought that's got people talking like this. So, uh, Aaron, you see the questions. I yeah. know you decide if they will make the show better or not. You make the decision. Um. Yeah, just let's park here briefly. Daniel Mason basically wants to ask Todd. As a practicing Catholic, how does uh, he process events and actions that reflect negatively on the Catholic Church, like sexual abuse allegations or the Pope going crazy? Does it make him question the validity of Catholicism? Now, I don't, I'm more interested in here, Steve knows me well enough, but I think his how he processes it because he's talked he he said very interesting things about catholicism all the time i'll set him up this way he uh, and i just got done telling somebody this uh because somebody asked me what steve thinks about that i said steve has long believed uh that if you catholics would actually sh- you know go full 400 pound gorilla uh i'd my ears might perk up because i'd like to see that in action but my whole life i see a catholic church that spends a lot of time pulling its punches and like what's what's the point of all that authority if you don't wield it you've got mm-hmm. so like that 
which is uh, I can't. Now, argue, here's why I can't here, argue with that. Here, you know here, how many here, people? Here, here's why I have that position. Yeah. Um, because I'll have Catholics email me and say that's a cop out. No, it's not. It's actually Jesus's standard. By you, but you'll know if a tree by yeah, its yeah. fruit. I'm just simply, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know 2000 years of history. I don't know all of your historical claims yeah. I, and I wouldn't know who to go to, to vet the, the veracity and integrity, like the Constantine question we just had. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know. I, I wasn't standing on the battlefield with Constantine. I don't know if he saw a vision or not. I suppose we can look at the fruit ultimately of what came in his life afterwards and the influence that Christianity had in Rome afterwards and determine whether by the fruit that was demonstrated from that, from that claim, whether or or not that claim had integrity or not but but i have not gone back and researched it why because i don't live in fifth century rome right and so there's not really a need for me to know when i say that i'm applying the same standard what but you know a tree by its fruit i have no way of verifying all of your historical claims i could find i i i've actually studied your religion as you know uh, so i know that you guys don't just you guys actually try to have biblical cases for things like the rosary and things of that nature. There's a biblical exegesis for it. All right. Similar to things that that we have traditions. There are some of those in Protestantism as well. So my question then becomes, okay, well, how do I balance each of your claims? How do I know? Well, I guess I'll just look at the fruit on the tree. Like I like this question, for example, is not a fair question to ask Todd. Here's why. If you're sola scriptura, all kinds of people have used the Bible to do terrible things. So do we abandon sola scriptura now because people have used the Bible out of context to do terrible things. And so therefore, the Bible must not be true. Congratulations. Those are the arguments that skeptics and scoffers who are all going to hell make. All right. So in the end, you know a tree by its fruit. And that to me, for, for me to more seriously consider your historical claims vis-a-vis historical counterclaims would be for me to look at and say, okay, well, how seriously do you live out your own historical claims mm-hmm. then? They can tie some of these you questions. You know a tree yes. by its fruit. Tie some of these questions toge- together. Yeah, it, it's, is it deeply frustrating right now that we have a pope that will not excommunicate the second Catholic president of the United States for uh, like just being publicly godless if not anti-god absolutely go back in history that that around the 500 ad i i don't know exactly there there was a uh uh saint Am- well no i think it was saint uh, ambrose who uh publicly uh called out the emperor i think it was theodosius and if i've got any of these names uh, wrong i uh, apologize but actually called him to public repentance an emperor came to not even the pope but uh, as, as, uh, if, if my recollection is right, St. Ambrose knelt uh, before him and publicly apologized uh, for his sins. That was the power of the church in that culture. I think if that happened today, I, don't, I know Steve's popping some corn. That's all I'm saying. You know, I'm not saying he's changing his theology, but he's like, I'm, I'm yeah, listening. I'm, I'm listening. listening. So where do, where, where, where do you want me to join? Tell me, tell me which tribe you want me to join. The one telling people that um, uh, if they don't have enough faith, then they can't get healed. And so therefore they died of cancer because they didn't have enough faith. Want me to join that one? How about the one that tells you that if you don't have washboard abs at 50 and, and a fat bank account, then you just really truly aren't a Christian. Want me to join that tribe? Here's the tribe I'm on. Word of God. And by the fruit, you'll know them. So... Do you think these I don't are- believe a bad tree? You know, and guess where I got this idea that a bad tree cannot produce good fruit and a good tree cannot produce bad fruit? You know where I got that idea? I do. Yeah. Right out of the word. So those are the words of our Lord directly. So that's what I look at. Do you think this, these questions coming up are a sign that you are having more success, at least within our audience, than you thought that they, they've, they've, they're forsaking politics and really just getting into a biblical worldview and now oh. are trying... Should we move on to Truth Social real quick? Yes. We'll start with two of these questions. Emmy Got a Gun asks, do you regret not covering election fraud? Nova Minority <laughs> wants to know, will you support Trump in the general? <laughs> you were saying... <laughs> Oh, I didn't even, I didn't see that he picked him out. See, I didn't even know. (laughs) I was literally the first guy in America on a national platform 
Literally. Literally. Literally, this is true. As it was, was happening. The, as it was happening on election night 2020, and it was, an, it was a little place called Antrim County, Michigan. And I looked at those results in real time sitting on the desk with Glenn, and I said, I'm calling BS on that. Something's not right there. I never heard the term. I've never heard the, I didn't, I didn't, I've never heard the term Dominion voting or smart ad. I, I don't even know what these machines do. I don't know. Didn't even know what any of this stuff was. I just know numbers. And in a community that small, you don't go from winning it overwhelmingly to losing it overwhelmingly with the same candidate. It doesn't work like that. There's something not right. Then, then like literally 30 seconds later, Fox calls Arizona for Biden. I called BS on that. So <laughs> we sat here on this show, go get, go get our shows after the election laying out the case for why the numbers don't add up. This is not congruent. This election is not legitimate. Urging the president to follow the path that would get you relief as opposed to wild theories that are never going to be deciphered and certainly not in the time period in which we had. How many did we not do that show for a month? Yes. Did I not get the entire Blaze platform demonetized on Facebook the morning after the election for calling out the ballot harvesting and the 4 yes. a.m. drop-offs on Glenn Beck's program? And that's the, this is the kind of stuff that leads people to start civil wars. Did, did that not happen? Do you regret it, Steve? Before we had to break, let's, let's tease <laughs> the next question because it's quite a bit more serious and more worth our time. Hockey Dad 16 says, I want to start teaching my son about our Lord. I'm a late bloomer, as I was saved about two years ago. Where would you start as far as the Bible? Oh, that's a great question. That is a great question. But I'm going to have an answer I think you are not suspecting. And it, it may sound like when we come back here in a minute, it may sound like I'm not answering your question. But I am. I'm just just not answering it, maybe in the way you expected. That is a very good question. Maybe there is hope for this hour yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, we will come back here in just a moment on The Blaze. Stay tuned. Back here on The Steve Day Show, you know, the fact is... There is one asset and one asset alone that has withstood famine, wars, political, economic upheaval, government debasement schemes like what we're currently seeing. And it's stated all the way back to biblical times. And that asset is gold. And you can own it right now in a tax sheltered retirement account with the help of Birch Gold. That's right. Birch Gold will help you convert an existing IRA or 401k, maybe even from a previous employer, and direct it right into an IRA with gold. And the best part, you don't have to pay a penny out of pocket. Just text Steve to 989-898. Text Steve to 989-898 for your free info kit right now. They'll hold your hand through the entire process. Think about it. When currencies fail, gold is the safe haven, like right now. So protect your savings with gold. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Thousands of happy customers. Text Steve to 989-898. That's 989-898. Text Steve there for your free info kit on gold. All right. Can we reset this last question? You bet. This right. is from Hockey Dad 16 who says, I want to start teaching my son about our Lord. I'm a late bloomer as I was saved about two years ago. Where would you start as far as the Bible? I would start Hockey Dad with you. The, f- the truth of the matter is you're going to be the first Bible that your son's going to truly encounter. So... I would, I would, if it, 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 in, to your, I would reframe your question to this. How and where do I study the word of God to become the kind of man I want and claim to be? And my son will notice and be inspired by that testimony. I'd start there. Start with you, the man in the mirror. And 
once, once, once I was on that path, and maybe you are, okay, and that's great, right? And then if you are, then I would, I would be more inclined to figure out where you and your son connect with the word of God than trying to artificially come up with an, a perfect area and spot uh, as a starting point. I mean, I don't know his age. Um, if he's a little younger, there are frankly some very mature themes in Genesis, for example. A lot of dysfunction, um, a lot of sexual promiscuity, things of that nature that he may be too young for. Right? This is the relational nature of Christianity. So, I would, I would start first with making sure that your relationship with your Lord is on the right track and producing fruit so that then you'll have credibility and integrity as you try to introduce him to the Lord as well. Next up, we have Patriot to Beagle, who wants to know, did you ever get a response with the book sent to Mar-a-Lago? Never did. I mean, dozens of you said you uh, sent us receipts. Not as many as sent books to Anthony Fauci. I mean, we had, <laughs> I think I think it's possible hundreds of copies of Fauci and Bargain got delivered to Fauci's office at NIH. In this case, though, I would say dozens of you sent us receipts that you had sent copies of Rise of the Fourth Reich to the former president's residence. And, you know, I, I, I saw today one of the uh, paid flunkies, and every, every campaign has their paid flunkies, okay? Uh, but one of the paid flunkies for the Trump campaign, names are relevant, no one in Iowa would know who it is, decided to come after me today on the grounds that uh, I'm not a long-term Trump loyalist. I, mean, I, I use this, is this breaking news? I mean, I'm not a long-term Trump loyalist. Here what I, here's, here's what I am, though. I am somebody who's won, I've been on more winning Iowa caucus campaigns than Donald Trump has. So... That's true, too. So I'm I'm not a long-term Trump loyalist. In fact, I'm really not a long-term anybody loyalist. I'm a long-term Jesus loyalist. Be 20 years this September. Long-term Jesus loyalist, not really a long-term loyalist at any other cause or crusade. Every other cause or crusade, it's a moment-by-moment loyalist. Like, do we line up right now with the cause of Jesus? Yes, I'm in. No, I'm not. Doesn't matter if you did five minutes ago. Doesn't matter if you did last year. Doesn't matter if you didn't five minutes ago. Doesn't matter if you didn't five years ago. If this lines up with the kingdom of God, I'm in. If it doesn't, I'm not. Except for my own sinfulness, of course, which I have to wrestle with constantly, which doesn't always want to line up with the kingdom of God. But I'm speaking of when I'm being asked to join or align with specific people or causes in this case. So... Um, I had one of these flunkies come at me today that I'm not a long-term Trump loyalist. Well, I got on their radar because apparently Maggie Haberman of the New York Times, the reporter that Trump has long been obsessed with, apparently included in some article, which of course, since it was the New York Times, I've not read or seen, uh, several things that I said on Twitter about the ridiculousness of this weekend. So that clearly irked them and got on there got on their radar, and so now they want to come at me. Now stop and think about, it's not been any of my criticisms on actual issues that affect our way of life. They, they, could, never, they could never acknowledge me during any of those disagreements, right? Mm-hmm. It's only because Maggie Haberman pointed out that, that Trump's campaign looked ridiculous in Iowa this weekend. And so now, since the ego is bruised, out comes the butt hurt. But I'll, I'll repeat what I said to him in reply on Twitter today. I'm, I'm happy to, I would be happy to introduce the former president to the term excess deaths, show him what they look like and have looked like in America and countries across the globe since the introduction of Operation Warp Speed's poisonous pokes and products, and urge him to come to grips with the fact that this thing's a miserable failure, and as president, he needs to stop it. And we could use his voice right now. Over the weekend, I got a, I got a text from somebody who said, uh, <clears throat> you guys know, you've met him, 
our, our new friend Charles mm. sent me a text. He said, I know you're really getting hit right now, but keep it up. I've still got that friend that never came home from lockdowns because his AA group got taken away from him when the church was closed. Churches were closed and shuttered, and he's dead now. My mom died shortly after taking that jab. So don't give up asking those questions. Don't give up challenging those who initiated those policies that created too many stories like my family's. And that's why I'm going to keep doing it. It may or may not be great for business, may or may not be great for ratings. Had so many of you, well, I shouldn't say you. I had so many people tell me this weekend, I'm never going to see your movie, never going to watch it. My ego works in reverse of that. Like, you have to worry about my ego going the other way. Like, pushing too hard on you because I take pride in being the last man standing. I don't take pride in joining your group. I take pride in not doing it. So when you tell me <clears throat> I'm going to threaten you, I'm not going to listen anymore, I'm never going to see nefarious or anything of that nature, okay, deal. I'm in. I don't want you to see it. And I would, I, I, there's under no conditions would I do one single solitary thing to kiss your ass even one time. Never going to happen. And there's no one to call. No one to complain to. I own the show. By God's grace, my own company owns the show. Sure, the Blaze may decide not to carry it anymore, but I still will have a Steve Day show. There's no one to call. <clears throat> There's no one to complain to. No one to get upset with. Throughout this entire journey, I took the path of not cashing in, not selling out, so I could have maximum freedom, so I could tell you the things that I thought were true even when you didn't want to hear them, like I'm doing now. That's what feeds my ego. It isn't your applause. It's not that. Not your threats. It is fulfilling the mission I think that I'm on. So those, those sorts of things don't threaten me on any level at all. In fact, they motivate me. I've seen the comment a couple of times that uh, you may have put the success of the movie at risk because you go too hard after Trump. That's not the burn that you think it is. That speaks ill, that speaks ill, if you are correct, mm -hmm. that speaks ill of the people you're talking about, that they would not go and support a movie with messages you agree with because of the executive producer and his comments about a beloved political figure. That's not the burn you think. That's not the burn you think. No, it's not. I mean, after all, tell me what, tell me what policy I'm criticizing him on that you disagree with. Who, who's, who's less likely to take the jab? A Trump voter or a Biden voter? A Trump voter. So then why would... We're on the same side. Um, who's, who's, who's more likely to say, yes, we should execute pedo groomers? Uh, not, not, tell, not have Don Jr. say, lay off a of Bud Light. A Trump voter or a Biden voter? Trump. Yeah. So what's funny about this is it's never about I'm running to Trump's left on the issues. It's never about that. It's about, I won't fillet and pet your idol. I'm here to smash your idols. That's my job. That's why I was put here. More than anything else, <clears throat> I was put here to smash your idols. And that's my mission, to smash them. And I enjoy it. Because that's what I was made to do, smash your idols. And I will not do it one day less or one day more than God will permit me to do. So, so with the time I have, I'm going to smash as many of them as I possibly can. When you tell me it's not about the issues, it's about a person, then what you're telling me is you're in a cult of personality. And I don't care if you're a relative of mine, Todd's, Aaron's, friends, we sit next to each other at church, we work together, we're in the same company. It does, I don't care. It's true. So I'm going to tell you that. It's not about a person. And if it is for you, you're in a cult. Why do I like Ron DeSantis? Because he does policies I like. I don't know poop about him. I saw him for 10 minutes on Saturday. We talked breakfast pizza. I don't care. Guess what, guess what my opinion on Ron DeSantis will be when he, stops, when he starts doing stuff I don't like? You guys have said here for how many years? You can guess. What do you think my opinion of Ron DeSantis will be if he starts doing stuff I don't like? What do you think it'll be? It'll be bad. It'll be bad. 
Because I got a pretty, I'm pretty simple. If you do stuff I like, I like it. If you do stuff I don't like, I don't like it. It's a very complicated, sophisticated process. And it don't work for anybody but me. And I don't answer to anybody but my own company elders and my maker. So I don't have a grift. I don't have an angle. I don't have a side hustle. Anything I sign up to do, don't do, it's all about, do I get to smash idols? So if you're telling me that, well, I agree with you on the issues, I just, you know, I want you to basically lie to me when Trump doesn't agree with me on the issues. No, I'm not going to do that. I won't do that if it's Ron DeSantis or your mom or Ronald Reagan or Moses or Elijah or Ezekiel uh, or Jesus Shuttlesworth. No, I won't. You guys are here every day. You've known for how many years? This is, this is, I can't be any more honest than that. On or off the air, that, that's pretty much the calculus around here, right? Absolutely. If you agree with me, I like you. If you don't, I don't. But that's not driven by ego. I don't care what you think. Did I say, if you like me, I like you. Is that no. what I said? I don't no. care. I, I don't care. I really don't. I'd have been totally fine not standing outside for an hour waiting to talk breakfast pizza with Ron DeSantis and instead playing Jedi Survivor with my kid on Saturday night. I don't care. If we agree, great. I agree. If we don't, I don't. Then it's not great. That's really the formula. There is no more complicated math than that. Next up, lightening the mood a little bit. Florida man in Texas says, since we all know Aaron is going to demand an in-office koi pond in his next contract <laughs> extension. I had not even considered that, but thank you for the idea, Florida man. What's the most eccentric and bougie thing you've demanded in a contract? Have you ever demanded any, anything eccentric or bougie? No, I haven't. Uh, well, I did demand in the nefarious contract no cheesy conversion scenes. That's the only thing I can. Is that think the, of. is that does that That's meet that not threshold? Really bougie though. Okay, and the only contract demand I've ever made throughout my career is I've always demanded um, uh, I'd take less money for more vacation time and freedom because the kids were young and I wanted to be home and be a dad and stuff more. You know, now as the kids are getting older and leaving, I that might be. In reverse, I might start demanding more money now and less time off. <laughs> All right. But, um, you know, like I always demanded instead of asking for money, I always asked for more vacation time. You know, so pay me the same rate, but give me more time off so I can be still, you know, uh, the meters running and I can still have more family time. That's the way I used to operate and have up until now. It might change now with the kids getting older. So what about you? Oh, have I ever demanded anything bougie of you? If like in any contract, you had jobs before this one, you know. Well, no, I didn't have a. I at the Des Moines Register, what what? I had no options. <laughs> I had zero options. I will tell you, nice. since we share office space with uh, the family leader. I don't know how many thousands of dollars of their coffee that I've drank in the time that I've worked for you. I feel maybe I should make a donation at some point. To the family. Think leader. you're in the red there? Oh, think. Think I know. you're in the black there? Yeah. Ah, 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 ah. Okay, sorry. Uh, How about is it bougie to say, um, get rid of the wasp nests? Yeah. Is that is that bougie? <laughs> to make that, that demand. That was intense. That I'm allergic to. Man. Get rid of those. Um, those do we have time days. for one final question here, quickly? Sure. This is from Patrick Columba. Basically, I'll boil this down. He wants to know, since we're sick of mainstream media and the corruption there, is it a good idea to vote on elected news anchors on every newscast? And li likewise, something similar for big tech corporations. <laughs> I don't know how good of an idea it is. I just know it would lead to better outcomes than what we currently have. Like, you know, I'm not into mobocracies. Um... And uh, I believe in um, a republic if you can keep it, okay? But, and I prefer, much prefer the American Revolution to the French Revolution. However, I also prefer the French Revolution to the Bolshevik Revolution. Fair? I do, I do prefer that. So if, if it, this is more French Revolution-y than American Revolution-y to me, but since we're talking about hitting back on the Bolshevik, Bolshevik Revolution... I'll tune in. I'll listen. 
I'm, I'm, I think that's not a terrible idea. It's better than let's just employ these, uh, uh, these hacktivists in, for an indefinite period of time with no accountability at all. At least now there's an accountability mechanism, right? Sure. Yeah. Well, one would think, but then the red wave that wasn't. Well, damn it, Erzin, I'm trying here. <laughs> all right. We're going to stick around and do overtime for Blaze TV subscribers. For the rest of you, we will see you tomorrow, noon to 2 Eastern, right after Hall of Famer Glenn Beck right here on Blaze TV. Until then, John 317.